I uh, will introduce our two guests now. And with the words that Matthew actually left with us um, in 2013 when he was here before, and I wrote these down. We need merely understand that the evolutionary process is neither random nor determined, but creative, but creative. Ladies and gentlemen, Matthew Fox and Ilya Dalio. Well, thank you for coming this evening. It's been a, a really full day. Uh, and I have to tell you, I am really awed and inspired to be in the presence of Matthew Fox, who as a student years ago, I too read his works and um, found them so illuminating. So when Randy invited me to be a speaker with Matt Fox, I was like, really, seriously? Uh, so, um, so Matt, thank you for the work that you're doing and you know, the brilliance of your insights that you continue to, to share with so many. Well, thank you. I certainly enjoyed your presentations and uh, not only the uh, intellectual craft that goes with it, but your passion and uh, your humor. I, I like scientists who have a sense of humor. <laughs> and theologians, too. They're harder to find, but they're... That, that's right. It's, it's, they are out there. <laughs> I'm sure of it. You know, <laughs> the, the poet Yeats had a marvelous uh, line years ago. He said something like, uh, theologians are the ones who put terror into the hearts of children. <laughs> You know, I never wanted to be a theologian. Really? Never. Oh. Never. It never crossed my mind to be a theologian. Um, I was always a scientist and... Uh, you lost a bet? <laughs> <laughs> no, I became a Franciscan. Uh, uh -huh. Yeah. And uh, I was incorrigible, basically. Uh -huh. You know, I drove everyone crazy. So they thought the best thing to do with me would be to send me to school. Uh, and so they asked, would I study spirituality? And I said, that sounds kind of light and fluffy, you know. <laughs> so I said, well, how about theology? And they said, sure, that's great. Go study theology. And I said, oh, theology, read a few books, write a few papers, you know. That should be fun. Uh, I, w I didn't take it seriously at all. I, did, I just did it as a second-year novice uh, to get out of the house. And uh, it's just amazing. It really is amazing. So I always tell my students, do not worry about your you know, career plans. They will change. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. Joe Campbell has a great line along that, that uh, same route. He says, uh, none of us lives the life we had intended. None. Yes. None. I think that's true of you. It's certainly true of me. I had no inkling joining the Dominicans as a young person that I'd end up as an Episcopal priest and having pissed off a couple of popes and uh, there you go. Lots, yeah. of, lots of bishops and what do you know? So you are the cosmos unfolding, right? It's, yeah, there, and it's so no... much more interesting if we had a five-year plan or a 30-year plan, isn't yes, it? Yes, there is no plan. That's the plan. Exactly. Uh -huh. There you go. Go with the flow, I guess. <laughs> go with the flow. <clears throat> um, yeah, do you have any questions? Or, I mean, can, now that we have a face-to-face, -face, you know, right. in the presence of our this friends is, here. The... Yeah, this is completely unrehearsed. Um, well, one question I had was, when did you first learn you wanted to be a scientist? Hmm. When I recognized, my mother and my sister were nurses, and I didn't want to be a nurse. So um, I was always fascinated by science in high school. And I, well, I was a romantic, so I'm, I'm a big dreamer. And my dream was to solve a major disease. You know, I, I wanted to win the Nobel Prize of some sort. Um, and to be really quite honestly, I just, I just finished a book, actually, I'm just finishing, it's called, it's my memoir of how I became a cyborg Christian. Um, uh, yeah, the, the subtitle is From Cradle Catholic to Cyborg Christian. Um, basically, I, I actually fell in love with a neurobiologist, to be quite honest, and, you know, love does many things, and, and in fact, it can affect your career. Uh, so... <laughs> And I loved neurobiology. Uh, so I lo always loved science. And then when I discovered the brain, I worked uh, ac actually in a mental institution for two summers and really just fascinated by mental disease uh, and the fragility of the brain uh, and the fact that we're so highly tuned, you know, neurologically. Uh, so I found science just captivating, quite honestly. Uh, I loved research science. Um, for me, it was a whole, maybe if I could, I wouldn't put it in this language then, but it was like a spirituality quest. 
uh, you are in this field of unknowing uh, and this path of discovery. And uh, I remember the first time I actually recorded, I was a, an electrophysiologist by training. So I studied the electrical component of the nervous system in an animal model of ALS. And so I had to isolate one single motor neuron unit uh, in a cat with a microelectrode out of 300 million neurons, you know. And the day I did that, I, I was like, I, I mean, it was like discovering, you know, the universe itself. I ran out of the lab. I was ecstatic. It was an ecstatic moment. And I really found, believe it or not, um, there was something, and I wasn't thinking about God in the lab, but there was such mystery to what we were doing. I mean, we, we couldn't quite put our finger on it, right? Our mathematics didn't quite answer all our questions. Our, our, you know, even our electrophysiological findings didn't answer the questions. And it was elusive. There was a mystery, a depth there. And uh, I remember writing in my dissertation, the, the first page was, in, in a single cell of life lay the mysteries of creation. This is way before you know, anything about theology or creation or whatever. So science, I, I think science has a bad rap. Uh, because it really is a captivating field. Uh, nature is so fantastic in its mi mysteries and its secrets, and there's a beauty to doing science. So I kind of miss it, quite honestly. You know, I miss the lab. Sure. Yeah. Well, it's in my, my experience, I, I love to ask scientists that question. And 95% of the time, they scratch their head and they say, well, like when I asked Rupert Sheldrick that question years ago, and he said, well, he said, I fell in love with a bush when I was five years old. Uh, my father was a naturalist, and he took me around and showed me a lot of vegetation. But I fell in love with that bush. And then he said, oh, my God, I never made this connection. I did my doctoral thesis on that bush. <laughs> and uh, I was once lecturing at Temple University. And um, during the Q&A, this uh, chemist, uh, chemical, or chemist professor, um, stood up. He, he looked exactly like El Elmer Fudd, bald and short. And, and he asked me this utterly, utterly complex question about chemistry and something else. Uh, maybe it was spirituality. But instead of answering him directly, I said, tell me, when did you first d decide you want to be a scientist? And uh, he stopped and he scratched his bald head. And he said, well, he said, I fell in love with with the rock when I was six years old. And um, it, men and women, biologists and chemists and physiologists, have come up with that same question time and again. You, you, you were a little later, I think. But it's so interesting to me that science is a vocation, it's a calling, it's a love affair. It is. You fall it's in love, love with affair. nature. You do. Yeah, yeah of that's course. That's what happens, you know. And that's how it should be. That's how our, um, you know, my book on the reinvention of work, I, I talk about how Luther talked about the priesthood of all uh, believers, but I talk about the priesthood of all workers. That if people are doing good work in the world, you are a midwife of grace, and that for me is the archetypal definition of priest, being a midwife of grace. And um, this makes all the difference for people to hear this, that mm. there is the spiritual calling. You know, spiritual calling isn't about joining a convent right. uh, in any exclusive way, but um, it's about service, and it's about the joy yeah. of a calling, the joy of giving back. So I think that's a paradigm shift that we need to make too at this time, that all the professions were originally in their pristine state, were invented, if you will, uh, as, a, uh, as a service to community, to the community. Yeah. And we, a lot of, you know, along the way, we've often lost track of that and it becomes something else. But a time like ours when we need to kind of um, regenerate our values and our common um, sense of community yeah, and, uh, and, and really excite the young people about what they can give in whatever profession they feel called to. I think that's true, Matt, although I have to tell you, when I was in college, uh, I didn't think that, I, I thought studying theology was the most ridiculous thing you could do. Uh, I was really one of, I was a hardcore scientist, you have to remember mm -hmm. this. Mm -hmm. So I thought, what, how could you possibly study God? That's what I would ask. How that, that's, oh. <laughs> and I think that is so ridiculous, you know. And so I was very dismissive, I have to, mm -hmm. I, I have to tell you. I was very dismissive of, of theology and philosophy. I thought, mm -hmm. oh, well, philosophy was interesting. Theo theology, I thought, really, don't they have anything better to do, you know, except. Uh, and so I really appreciate the science and religion 
dialogue and the way some scientists have difficulty with, in a sense, uh, inviting a theological dimension to mm -hmm. the questions. Mm -hmm. uh, because I go back to my own simple self, you might say, uh, and the way I sort of wrote off, I mean, I had to take two theology courses in college, but I literally memorized the material and then I quickly forgot it as soon as I walked out the door mm -hmm. because I thought it was irrelevant to the study, to the pursuit of truth, that science alone would, you know, would lead us to what we truly uh, seek to know, to true knowledge. So it's taken a long time to begin to appreciate that both of these areas are like what Teilhard would say, two lenses, right? Two sides of the same act of knowing. It's the one act of knowing in two different ways. Um, and I think that appreciation that science contributes a knowledge to our understanding of ourselves and world, and so does theology. And how to bring these two lenses into one pair of glasses for one, you know, one field of vision, I think is a great challenge for our age. Uh, but I've lived through that, you know, that separation of these two disciplines and then um, a growing into the integration of these disciplines. It's kind of interesting the way it has all unfolded, I have to admit.